It's a bird! It's a... frog? No, Marty. It's a hot air balloon. In this episode, we'll explore the evolution of ballooning throughout the centuries and the influence they've had on pushing boundaries to the very edges of our atmosphere. We'll visit Albuquerque, New Mexico to learn how these incredible balloons are made as well as the International Balloon Fiesta to discover the science behind flying these unique aircraft. You'll even get a chance to learn how to build and test your own lighter-than-air creation. This is STEM in 30. Today, we're talking about hot air balloons and the science behind how they fly. You know, like the little flame. It's not just about a fancy flamethrower, Marty. You have to know about weather patterns and the principles of convection, not to mention the hundreds of years it went into developing the hot air balloons we use today. And it's not just hot air balloons, they're also gas. That's true. These things continue to push the boundaries of what we think is humanly possible. Take this capsule, for example. In 2012, Felix Baumgartner hitched a ride on this by attaching it to a giant balloon. He went up 24 miles into the stratosphere where he took a supersonic leap of faith. If you think that's crazy, just wait until you hear about Alan Eustace. Tom, we're in front of the Red Bull Stratus capsule. Do you want to tell me a little bit about why we have this here at the museum? This capsule set two world altitude records, the highest a balloon had ever flown and the highest parachute jump. In October of 2012, Felix Baumgartner jumped with his parachute from this gondola from 128,000 feet, almost 128,000 feet. So world altitude balloon, world altitude parachute. Now this is a capsule and not a basket like we normally see on hot air balloons. So why do we have a capsule and not like a basket? Well, the higher you go, the lower the pressure. And when you're in an open basket, obviously you're in that low pressure. Uh, to make things a little easier and a little safer, this is a pressurized gondola. So he rides all the way up into the stratosphere pressurized. And it's only when he opens the door and gets out on the front step and jumps that his pressure suit uh, kicks in and then that's what protects him. Two years after Felix Baumgartner broke the highest altitude records, another person rose to the occasion. In 2016, Alan Eustace set new world records for the highest free fall jump and total free fall distance. Both Felix Baumgartner and Alan Eustace's teams built on the accomplishments of those before them to take humans further. Felix Baumgartner's team even worked with a man that held the records that Felix would go on to break, Colonel Joe Kittinger. You know, you learn that, you know, the way that science progresses is a lot of people asking questions over time. You know, I've been reading through my, my whole life on uh, how various people had set various records in the past. Colonel Joe Kittinger, who set the record in 1960, is kind of a personal hero and idol to me. And uh, learning about how he did it, what the reasons why he did it, uh, then with the Red Bull attempts, and then even going back, uh, you know, before that, uh, you know, some of the Russian attempts. Instead of a capsule like Felix Baumgartner, Alan Eustace's team developed a specially designed strato suit so that he could not only survive the high altitude, but the layers of the atmosphere. Understanding uh, the different layers of the atmosphere and how the atmosphere is built was super critical to understanding how this suit needed to be designed. The stratosphere averages about negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit, so it's very cold. So you cross through this point that we started calling the human thermal equilibrium zone, where the temperatures are kind of perfect. But then above that, you start getting to the point where it's too hot, where there's no air to pull heat away, and it starts being too warm in a suit. So understanding this, that the temperature kind of goes down and down and down until this point, and then it starts going up and that the pressure is going down and down and down and down all the way until you get to space where there's no pressure left is really critical to understanding how you would need to design a suit like this. Another difference that set Alan Eustace apart from Felix Baumgartner's jump was the use of a drogue chute during the entirety of his descent. A drogue chute is a parachute designed to help stabilize and slow the speed of a rapidly moving object. 
you know, we thought the addition of a drogue chute would eliminate spins. And Red Bull and Felix Baumgarten had a horrible spin, but they he didn't have a drogue chute. So we add a drogue chute, we put a dummy up, and we think, oh, all's well. And then this, this dummy spins at 180 uh, revolutions per minute. And it's like, we weren't expecting that. We were expecting it to fall pretty much flat. We could look back at, uh, at uh, Kittinger's jump. Well, why didn't he spin? Turns out by just moving uh, attachment point of the drogue from down here to up here, we can uh, almost eliminate spins. So it was that easy in hindsight. <laughs> but at the time, of course, it took a lot of dummies being pushed out of uh, aircraft before we figured out that that was the secret. And of course, we had a lot of help. We were standing on the shoulders of a lot of people that had figured it out before us. Wow, those guys were pretty brave. People have been trying to master the art of flying for centuries. Let's learn a little bit more about the history of ballooning from our balloon expert, Tom Crouch. Tom, do you want to tell me about the sheep, the duck, and the rooster? You bet, Beth. They were the first living creatures to fly. Uh, the Montgolfier brothers sent them up from the palace at Versailles in September 1783. People had flown the first small balloons, but they weren't really sure if there was air up there. So they flew the animals to prove that there was air up there. A few months later, on November 21st, the Montgolfier brothers assisted Jean-Francois Pilatre de Rosier and Francois Laurent d'Arlandes in becoming the first humans to successfully perform a free, untethered flight. Chemical scientist Jacques-Alexandre César Charles was also experimenting with flight by utilizing hydrogen, the lightest element to exist. On December 1st of that same year, Charles became the first to take flight in a hydrogen-filled balloon. Another revitalization took place in the 1950s when Ed Yost developed an onboard heat source to extend flights by burning kerosene. His invention allowed a balloon to carry a pilot up to 10,000 feet remain in the air for three hours, and be reused. In 2016, Bill Costin became the first African American to receive the Ed Yost Master Pilot Lifetime Achievement Award. The award recognizes lighter-than-air pilots who have demonstrated skill and expertise by maintaining safe operations for 40 or more consecutive years. Most people, it was their lifelong dream to go up in a balloon. So my thrill was watching their faces and gestures and everything as they were looking out over the countryside, you know, looking at the different scenes and everything. They were saying, oh, wow, look at this. Oh, wow, look at that. But flying 40 years of a balloon and not having an accident and, and taking up thousands of people and thousands of hours. You, you just experience everything. I mean, good and bad. I mean, I had uh, hairy experiences, beautiful experiences. Sometimes you just can't control the winds at all. So you, you just got to pick the best landing spot you can pick and hopefully land there. So I was successful in doing that for 40 years and becoming the first and, and probably only black master pilot in the country actually means everything. But the main thing was taking people up for rides. Ballooning really blew up, taking the world by storm. Let's check in with Vanessa and Greta, who work on the Evelyn Way Kendall Ballooning and Early Aviation Collection to preserve artifacts depicting early flight. Just as space travel profoundly influenced pop culture in the 20th and 21st centuries, when the first hot air balloon rose in the late 18th century, it influenced art, literature, and music for decades to come. The National Air and Space Museum collects art and other memorabilia related to ballooning to help tell this story. For every museum collection, there needs to be people to take care of it. For the National Air and Space Museum, a lot of the objects collected hold significance to the history of humans in flight and could not be replaced. Because of this, it's important to keep the objects safe for public viewing, research, and education for future generations. We have a robust team that takes care of objects in our collection when they are both on 
and off display. They do this by storing or displaying objects in a way that prevent damage. Cleaning, fixing, and stabilizing objects to prevent further deterioration. Restoring objects to the way they looked at a certain time. And keeping thorough records on what objects are made out of and what has been done to them. We have experts that specialize in restoring aircraft and spacecraft, conserving models, and even taking care of art. The Evelyn Way Kendall Ballooning and Early Aviation Collection was collected by Mrs. Kendall in the 1900s, and it's a collection that's about 700 um, artifacts and artworks related to ballooning and other early aircraft. I'm a museum specialist with the Collections Processing Unit. So that entails cataloging everything, putting it in proper storage, and taking photographs of all the objects so that we can put them in the database so we don't have to pull every object out of storage every time a curator or researcher wants to look at it. So this is an example of one of our objects. This is a band box or hat box from, it was made roughly in the 1850s and it's commemorating a flight that was done by uh, Richard Clayton in Ohio in 1835. And you can see here an example of the type of uh, boxes I'm making for the objects to uh, reduce handling and protect it in storage. Now normally this would have a lid, but you can see it has a drop front so that we can open the box and then you don't have to reach into the box to get the object. We can just slide it out. And I've also put bumpers on every side of the box so that it won't wobble around when you're carrying the box. Conservators are really interested in what materials objects are made of so they can decide the best way to take care of it. I'm a conservator and my specialty is in paper and photographic materials. This print, for example, came to us with several edge tears and whatever they had been repaired with in the past unfortunately left staining on the paper. So to remove the previous repairs, I bathed the paper, which also reduced some of the staining. Unfortunately, two of the corners were missing, but in order to repair that, I made two new corners out of an archival paper, which I toned to match the original paper. These are just a few of the many varied artifacts that we have here in the Kindle collection. Balloons have really evolved. Over time, aeronauts have made adjustments to both their balloons and baskets using new materials and technology. Let's take a look at how balloons are made today. Today I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico with Andy Richardson, owner of Adams Balloons. Thanks so much for talking with us today. Yeah, happy to be here. You guys actually built all of the balloons we see behind you. We did, every balloon on the wall here was manufactured at this shop. And that includes the Smithsonian balloon? That's our favorite one we've made so far. Now you guys actually build and do some other things here in this shop, right? We do, we're full service, so um, on top of the manufacturing, we also offer repairs and restorations for existing balloons. Can we go take a look? Sure, absolutely. Andy, this doesn't really look like where you build balloons. What goes on in this room? This is our FAA certified repair station. So all existing hot air balloons need annual inspections and reoccurring maintenance. So this is our facility set up for maintenance, stress testing, stress analysis of the condition of the aircraft after its initial production is finished. So it's very similar to a local airplane shop. We do maintenance specifically for balloons to make sure that the aircraft is safe to fly for the next year. Should we go take a look at where you actually put them together? Absolutely, let's go look at it. All right, let's go. This looks more like you would actually build a balloon up here. Can you tell us uh, what's going on on the table? Sure, so we're in the process of manufacturing a new balloon right now. And what we do is we layer the fabric and then we have a paper pattern that we lay on top of the fabric. And then we use our little grease markers and mark right over the top of the fabric to make the outline or trace the edge of the paper. And then it's up to the electric fabric cutter here to go right over the top of the fabric and it cuts all the panels identically, which makes it much, much easier for sewing. Now, how do you design these balloons? We use a CAD program. We use a computer program that does all of the stress analysis, all of the calculations, and we simply just fact check it during the building process so that we can produce the balloon exactly how the computer says. 
Do the special shaped balloons fly differently? They do. Special shaped balloons react differently in wind, so it's a challenge from a pilot and a crew standpoint to operate the special shapes. How many people does it take to, to launch a special shaped balloon? Uh, usually a pilot and a crew of about 10 to 15 people just to make sure that you're capable of handling any wind situations or anything like that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for showing us around Sure. Today. Not a problem. There are two different kinds of ballooning. One uses heat and the other different kinds of gas. Let's learn a little bit more about how gas ballooning works. Hydrogen and helium are two gases that are lighter than air. Most balloonists in the United States use helium. Although helium is slightly heavier than hydrogen, helium is non-flammable. Once the balloon is filled with enough helium and the combined weight of the balloon and gas becomes lighter than air, the balloon will float. In order to make the balloon rise, the pilot will drop sandbags, reducing the total weight of the balloon. In order to descend, the pilot pulls a rope to open a valve on the top of the balloon. This allows some gas to escape, making the balloon heavier and causing it to lose altitude. Hi, I'm Bridget, and today I'm going to try making my own hot air balloon. First, I'm going to need a heat source to warm the air and a way to make sure the hot air goes into my balloon and doesn't escape. For this, I'm using a small toaster with my parents' permission and a poster board I've taped into a cylinder around it to funnel the hot air. Now we need something to drop the air. I'm going to use a trash bag because it's thin and light. Next, I'm going to need something to weigh down the balloon edge of the bag so the balloon will stay upright and keep the hot air inside. To do this, I'm going to tie the bottom edges of the balloon. Now all I have to do is place my balloon on the heat source and watch what happens. When any gas, like the air trapped in my balloon, is heated, it expands and becomes less dense than the air around it. Because it's less dense, it will hopefully rise I can see the air trapped inside, but there isn't enough lift for the balloon to rise. This might be because there's too much wind out in the open, or the sun is too warm. I'm going to try making my next balloon with another lightweight material. Tissue paper! I cut the sheets and glued them together to resemble the shape of a balloon envelope. Let's try some other locations with different conditions to see if the balloon works there. That didn't work out quite the way I expected, but that's okay. There are lots of variables to consider when conducting an experiment. I'm trying it at night, so the air outside will be much cooler than inside my balloon. I created my own hot air balloon. The warm air from the toaster filled the balloon, allowing it to rise up. You can do this at home yourself. Just make sure you have an adult's permission and supervision while using your heat source. Great job, Bridget. Now let's take a look at the truly spectacular annual celebration of ballooning at the Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta. Every October, Albuquerque, New Mexico hosts the Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta, a nine-day celebration of all things ballooning that attracts over 700,000 visitors from around the world. Here you can see science and engineering in action. Balloons rise because the gas inside them is less dense than the surrounding air.
Special shaped balloons are marvels of math and engineering. And weather patterns are on full display as the balloons take to the skies for a breathtaking view of the Rio Grande Valley. Albuquerque, New Mexico is the perfect city to host a gigantic balloon fiesta in, and it all has to do with the weather. Albuquerque has this box of weather. There's wind and temperature changes and the balloon. You know what? Let's go on over to ABC's chief meteorologist, Ginger Z, to help us explain the Albuquerque box. Chief Meteorologist Ginger Z here to tell you about one of my favorite weather phenomenon. I like a lot of them, but this one's pretty cool and beautiful. It's called the Albuquerque Box, and it allows for the balloon fiesta to happen in Albuquerque, New Mexico every year. So you see that these balloons are actually traveling all within one space. If you know anything about hot air balloons, they can go up and down by the pilot, but they cannot steer. So they need natural air currents, and Albuquerque happens to be the perfect place thanks to its geography. It's in a valley, and so the cold air at night sinks down, and it creates kind of a northerly wind, right? But that northerly wind is at the surface. When the pilot takes that current and then rides it over to a certain place, they can go up and get to about 500 feet up where the southerly winds are coming up a little higher and so then they will ride that air current and they end up going in that box like shape it's almost like a ferris wheel of nature that the hot air balloon can ride it is a really brilliant and magical sight to see it's also perfect in albuquerque hope you learned a little something and maybe you can join the balloon fiesta someday Communication and teamwork play a huge role when executing something as complex as the balloon fiesta. Just like astronauts rely on mission control and planes on carriers depend on others to take off and land, balloon pilots depend on some additional help as well. The Zebras are a ground team of volunteers that help direct the flow of balloon traffic. Do you know what migrates to Albuquerque, New Mexico every October? Zebras! No, not those zebras. These zebras. And you would be hard pressed to find a more jovial cast of fun loving, flare wearing, costume designing characters. But underneath all that light hearted fun, these zebras have a most serious job to do. As launch directors for the annual Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta, they keep this, and this, and everyone in the crowd safe. People in the red hat, these yeah. are zebras in training. And they're training, and then we give them the reins on their second year. Can these guys put you through the ropes? And... That's what they're doing right now. We're doing on-the-job training. So they, they take us uh, by the arm and point out what we do right and teach us the, the way to do it correctly. Come on in, Bill. Yay! <laughs> Michelle, why don't you uh, tell us about the weather? It'll be sunny. <laughs> 800 033 at 4, 1000 feet at 022 at 5. After the morning flight briefing, the serious work begins. Take your time. I'm going right out here. We'll make eye contact when you're ready. I'll check your traffic and we'll get you up out of here, okay? In the end, the fun-loving Albuquerque Balloon Fiesta Zebras are in control of just one thing. Sunny! 
It's truly incredible to see how much the craft has evolved over the last 300 years, not to mention where it's headed. If you want to learn more about the history of ballooning, come on down to the National Air and Space Museum Stephen F. Udvarhazy Center and check out the Kendall Collection. And if you want to learn more about space and aviation related topics and maybe have a little bit of fun, be sure to follow STEM and 30 on Facebook and Twitter and subscribe to the National Air and Space Museum's YouTube channel. Thanks, Thanks for watching. For watching. <laughs> Boom, pretzel. <laughs> <laughs>